34B-1 has to do with sales literature that contains performance data in relation to investment companies. So this is a rule under the Investment Company Act of 1940. So anytime we have sales literature that contains performance data, this rule must be followed. If it's sales literature for a money market fund, it must follow this rule. The sales literature must accompany any quotation of yield or similar quotation purporting to demonstrate the income earned or distributions made by the money market fund with a quotation of current yield. So current yield is a formula that is, um, depending upon if we're talking stocks or bonds, the income received in that year, dividends or interest, divided by current market price. So any quotation of yield must be accompanied by a quotation of current yield. Sales literature for a money market fund must accompany any quotation of the money market fund's tax equivalent yield with a quotation of current yield. And accompany any quotation of the money market fund's total return with a quotation of the money market fund's current yield. So current yield is the income from this year divided by current market price, where total return is income plus appreciation or minus depreciation divided by what was paid for the security. So it's just this idea, if there's yield, then there must be current yield. If there's tax equivalent yield, then there must also be current yield. If there's a total return, there must also be current yield. The Total return and current yield placed next to each other in the same size print. And if there is a material difference between the quoted total return and the quoted current yield, include a statement that the yield quotations more, close, more closely reflect the current earnings of the money market fund than the total return quotation. So one of the things people are looking for in money market funds are preservation of capital. Certainly, it's very safe. Um, but sometimes they're looking for income too, which is not, money market funds especially today are, are really not very good as far as income goes. If the sales literature is for an investment company that is not a money market fund, so it's a growth fund, it's an international fund, it's other than a money market fund, and it contains performance data, it must include total return information for one, five, and 10 year periods of time or since fund inception if new. Must accompany any quotation of performance adjusted to reflect the effect of taxes with the quotation of total return. Now, this is throwing a lot of math stuff, at least terms for math out there that you're not gonna know yet. So you're gonna learn about current yield and total return later on in the course. This is just, requirements under the rules for advertisements that, that contain past performance data. So I promise I will teach you the math if you need to know the math soon. The sales literature must accompany any quotation of yield or similar quotation purporting to demonstrate the income earned or distributions made by the company with a quotation of current yield. Tax equivalent yield must be accompanied by a quotation of current yield. So it's basically saying if they're doing anything other than current yield, it must be shown next to current yield because current yield is really the most recent data that we have. Any performance data included in sales literature must meet the currentness requirement of Rule 482. Currentness, it's a funny word. Rule 4082 requires that all performance data contained in any advertisement must be as of the most recent practicable date, considering the type of investment company and the media through which the data will be conveyed. Advertisements, any advertisement containing total return quotations will be considered to have complied with the currentness provision provided that the total return quotations are current to the most recent calendar quarter ended prior to the submission of the advertisement for publication. So the prior quarter, 
prior to submission of the advertisement for publication. So currentness. So they can't make an advertisement and show the return that was two years ago that was really good. No, that doesn't make sense. You, you could never do that. FINRA Conduct Rule 2020 states that no member firm shall affect any transaction in or induce the purchase or sale of any security by means of any manipulative, deceptive, or other fraudulent device or contrivance. Just sounds bad, don't do that. The Securities Exchange Act. So once again, other rules under the Securities Exchange Act. So it says a bank is not considered to be a broker simply because the bank engages in a third-party brokerage arrangement if the rules are followed. Now, this is very similar to the FINRA rule that we had for networking arrangements between banks and member firms. So, very similar rule, but this is under the People Act, the Securities Exchange Act. When the bank enters into a contractual or other written arrangement with a registered broker-dealer under which the broker-dealer offers brokerage services on or off the premises of the bank, the bank shall not be considered a broker-dealer if the following rules are met. Such broker-dealer is clearly identified as the person performing the brokerage services. The broker-dealer performs brokerage services in an area that is clearly marked and to the extent practicable, physically separate from the routine deposit taking activities of the bank. Any materials used by the bank to advertise or promote, generally the availability of brokerage services under the arrangement clearly indicates that the brokerage services are being provided by the broker dealer and not by the bank. Any materials used by the bank to advertise or promote the availability of the brokerage services must be in compliance with federal securities laws before distribution. Bank employees that are not registered reps can only perform clerical functions. However, bank employees may forward customer funds or securities and may describe in general terms the types of investment vehicles available from the bank and the broker dealer under the arrangement. Bank employees do not receive incentive compensation for any brokerage transaction unless the bank person is also an associated person of the member. Bank employees may receive compensation for the referral of any customer if the compensation is a nominal one-time cash fee of a fixed dollar amount and the payment of the fee is not contingent on whether the referral results in a transaction. Such services are provided by the broker-dealer on a basis in which all customers that receive any services are fully disclosed to the broker-dealer. The bank does not carry a securities account of the customer. The bank broker-dealer informs each customer that the brokerage services are provided by the broker-dealer and not by the bank and that the securities are not deposits or other obligations of the bank, are not guaranteed by the bank, and are not insured by the FDIC. So this rule says both the bank and the broker-dealer inform the customer of this. So the FINRA rule just said it was the broker-dealer's responsibility to do so. But you can see, you can hear, it's a very similar rule. So really the FINRA rule came from this portion of the Securities Exchange Act of 34. So I cover it twice because it's on the outline twice, but it's basically the same rule. Section 10 of the Securities Exchange Act of 34 says that it is unlawful for any person to make use of any means or instrumentality of interstate commerce or of the mails to use or employ any manipulative or deceptive device or contrivance. Just sounds bad. So that rule, those words appear over and over and over again under the Securities Act of 1933, under the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. No use of the mails to engage in fraud is basically what it's saying. Rule 10b-3 says that it shall be unlawful for any broker dealer directly or indirectly by the use of any means or instrumentality of interstate commerce or of the mails to engage in any act, practice, or course of business defined by the commission to be included within the terms. Here it is again, manipulative, deceptive, or other fraudulent device or contrivance. 
The Securities Act of 1933 has Section 10, which describes the information that must be found in a prospectus. The prospectus relating to a security must contain the information that's found in the registration statement, but not all of it. If somebody wants to look at the registration statement, they can, but it's so long. But it, the idea is that it contains the same information, not different information from what was filed with the SEC. If a prospectus is used more than nine months after the effective date of the registration statement, the information contained in the prospectus shall be as of a date not more than 16 months prior to such use. So it's basically saying you can't just make a prospectus and then use it forever. So it gets old after a while, it must be updated. Under the Paper Act, Section 23, this is that idea, and we've mentioned it again, so in a slightly different format now. What must be disclosed? In the prospectus, all material facts. So they cannot misstate a material fact. They cannot omit a material fact. Everything filed with the SEC must be true and accurate. No untrue statements, no omissions that are material. We can never say that the Commission has in any way passed upon the merits of or given approval to a, to a securities offering. The SEC does not approve anything. SEC Regulation D. This is the Federal Private Placement Rule. So let's talk about this one. We mentioned already that if we're going to sell a new issue, the new issue must be, the sale of the new issue must be accompanied or preceded by a prospectus under the Securities Act of 1933. Now, Regulation D is the federal private placement rule. And a private placement is a way to sell securities that is what we call an exempt transaction. So what it's going to allow us to do if we follow all the rules. So it allows the sale legally. That's repetitive, I know, but it's important to say this that way. Allows the sale legally of an unregistered non-exempt security. Oh yeah, that's why I talked about all that stuff before. I wasn't just talking for no reason, I promise. So a non-exempt security is one that what? Must be registered, but this one is not registered. How do we sell it legally? Through SEC Regulation D. It allows the legal sale of securities that under normal situations require registration. So we could do a private placement of variable life insurance. We can sell um, all sorts of issues this way. It introduces some new terms to us. So we have different rules. There's SEC Rule 501, 506, and a new term called accredited investors. So the basic gist of the rules, you can sell to an unlimited number of accredited investors these securities, these unregistered, non-exempt securities. Think about it. Accredited investors should be what kind of people? People that are normal, everyday, average people? No. They're people that know a little, have some money, have some investment experience, they can afford to lose some money maybe. It's a riskier investment. Not that you want to lose anyone's money, but the idea of it. So under Regulation D, we can sell this private placement to an unlimited number of accredited investors. And up to, generally, 35 non-accredited investors. So these are everyday average people. They're non-accredited. So this definition, accredited investor, very important that we tie them together with Regulation D, the Federal Private Placement Rule. 
an individual with a net worth of a million dollars or more. So that would be the husband and wife net worth of a million dollars or more. Not the friend and the friend. The husband and the wife would be fine though. So net worth of a million dollars or more. So this is an individual. Yes, husband and wife would be okay. You can combine their assets and their liabilities. It also includes institutional investors. So banks, insurance companies, and large pension plans are included within the definition of an accredited investor, institutional investors. More than 60% of the trades that occur in the secondary market occur institutionally. So they're doing a lot of business. So they can buy, as accredited investors, these private placements. Tax exempt organizations or trusts with total assets in excess of five million. Trusts or tax exempt organizations with assets in excess of five million. So those are really the three categories of accredited investors. So rule 506 is Reg D's what we call safe harbor rule. Companies using this rule can raise an unlimited amount of money. There are certain rules that must be followed. So today this is the rule and then tomorrow, well probably not tomorrow, but sometime soon, I am waiting on some changes to Reg D rules under the Jumpstart Our Businesses uh, Act, the Jobs Act. Um, so what I'm saying now, you know, for the purposes of the test will be true for a very long time, but um, potentially will change under the Jobs Act. But true for now. Under Reg D, Rule 506, the company cannot use general solicitation or advertising to market these securities. So no general advertising. So that's a pretty big deal. No advertising. And that's really the biggest thing that down the road someday I would see would change. The company may sell these securities to how many accredited investors? Unlimited and up to 35 other. Now they don't use non-accredited investor, they use the term sophisticated purchasers. So that's someone that doesn't meet the accredited investor standard but yet has some idea of how the markets as a whole work, sophisticated purchasers. Companies must still give out disclosure information similar to a prospectus, but it's not a prospectus because these shares are not registered. The company must be available to answer any questions of prospective purchasers. And when you purchase shares sold through a private placement, what you're purchasing are called restricted securities. So they're not freely saleable. You are purchasing restricted securities. And restri restricted securities have, um, under what's called Rule 144, a one-year uh, or six month holding period, depending upon a couple other things that we'll learn later on. One year or six month holding period. But the most important thing is that they're restricted securities. They are not freely saleable. They are not. So that is Reg D, the Federal Private Placement Rule. Rule 431 and Rule 498 are both rules about what is called a summary prospectus. And this is something I've hinted at all along because there has been this shift. So old-fashioned me, I always say whenever you sell a new issue, you must give out a prospectus at or before the time of sale because that's just how it's always been but it's allowed to give out today a summary prospectus. So rule 431 is the summary prospectus rule for an issuer other than an investment company. And rule 498 is the summary prospectus rule for mutual fund shares. So, but the whole gist of the rules is very similar. It's the idea of what does the summary prospectus have to include and if you give out a summary prospectus, so long as the full statutory prospectus is available online, you basically satisfied the rule that said you must give out a prospectus prior to sale. 
you've basically satisfied that. Because, I mean, whoever hands you anything today anymore, I mean, it's so very rare. So they do have to give you or hand you the summary prospectus and the, the full prospectus must be available online. So rule 431 is the rule for a company that's not a mutual fund company. So who can follow this rule? Um, different types of issuers can follow this summary prospectus rule. If the registrant is uh, organized under the laws of the US, or if it's a foreign private issuer, or if it has a class of securities already registered under the Act, if it's required to file reports under the Act, if they've always filed the reports timely for the last 36 months, if neither the res registrant or any of its consolidated or unconsolidated subsidiaries, if they have, if they have not failed to pay a dividend, uh, defaulted on an installment, so the summary prospectus is required to contain information in a very specific ma manner. So I'm not going to read you the rules as far as in, there's specific instructions prepared by the SEC as to what the summary prospectus must include. It must be written in plain English. It must follow a standardized format. All of the information included in the summary prospectus is allowed to be expressed in a condensed or summarized manner whatever is appropriate. It, the information need not follow the numerical sequence of the items of the form used for registration, but they do follow a specific order. It's the directions for the summary prospectus. Every summary prospectus shall be dated approximately as of the date of its first use. Sometimes they give out this summary prospectus prior to when the issue is actually cleared for sale. It's really, in the old days, we called this a red herring, where you would give out a preliminary prospectus, but now it's a preliminary summary prospectus. So if this is given out prior to the effective date of the registration, it must include the following disclosure. Copies of a more complete prospectus may be obtained from name, address, telephone number. If the summary prospectus is published in a newspaper, magazine, or other periodical, it need to be set in a type at least as large as a seven-point modern type. Eight copies of every proposed summary prospectus are filed as part of the registration statement. The Rule 498 governs the prospectus that may be given the summary prospectus that may be given for mutual fund companies. So this idea that the summary prospectus includes key information found in the summary section of the statutory prospectus in the same order that is required in the statutory prospectus. Included on the cover page of the summary prospectus or at the beginning of the summary prospectus must be found the fund's name and the class or classes, if any, to which the summary prospectus relates. The exchange ticker symbol of the fund's shares, if it's a closed-end fund or an exchange-traded fund, or if the summary prospectus relates to one or more classes of the fund shares adjacent to each class, the exchange ticker symbol of each class of the fund's shares. If it's an exchange traded fund, it must also identify the principal U.S. market or markets in which the fund shares are traded. The cover page must include a statement identifying the document as a summary prospectus, the approximate date of the summary prospectus's first use, and the following legend. Before you invest, you may want to review the fund's prospectus, which contains more information about the fund and its risks. You can find the fund's prospectus and other information about the fund online at www.mutualfundprospectus.com. I made that up. So whatever the company's website is. You can also get this information at no cost by calling the phone number or by sending an email request to the email address. The summary prospectus can be used to describe one fund or it may describe more than one class of a fund. So it can describe 
one fund or more than one class of a fund. So class A shares, class B shares, class D shares, class C shares, class E shares. There's different classes of fund shares that we'll learn about later on. Now, information that's presented on a website under this rule must include information that is human readable, that would be helpful, and capable of being printed on paper in a human readable format. And we had mentioned the disclosure on the first page must say how to get, where to go to find the prospectus, so where the statutory prospectus is found, and that you may call us and request a prospectus. So upon an individual's request, the fund must send at no cost to the requester by U.S. mail, first class mail, so that's just normal mail, put a stamp on it, whatever they ask for. So a copy in paper of the fund's statutory prospectus, maybe it's a statement of additional information, the most annual, recent annual and semi-annual reports. Who must they provide this to and when must they provide this to? Any person requesting a copy it must be provided to them within three business days after receiving a request. If they request an email with this information, they must also satisfy, the fund must satisfy the request via email within three business days after receiving a request. So the requirement to send an electronic copy of a document by email may be satisfied by sending a direct link to the document on the internet, provided that a current version of the document is readily available through the link from the time that the email is sent through the date that is six months after the date that the email is sent. And the email explains both how long the link will remain usable and that if the recipient desires to retain a copy of the document, he or she should access and then save the document. So I would definitely know the rule. If they ask for the statutory prospectus to be sent to them in the mail, first class mail within three business days. If they want to be email, respond to them within three business days and a link is just fine. Information found in the summary prospectus must be the same information found in the statutory prospectus, although it's not as extensive in nature. So it really is a shift, this no longer do you give out the full prospectus, you give out a summary prospectus and then the full prospectus is available online. Under the Investment Company Act of 1940, there's section 35 that talks about unlawful representation and names. It is unlawful for any person issuing or selling any security of which a registered investment company is the issuer to represent or to imply in any manner whatsoever that any security or company has been, these are all bad, don't do these things, has been guaranteed, sponsored, recommended, or approved by the United States or any agency, instrumentality, or officer of the United States, that it has been insured by the FDIC, no, is guaranteed by or is otherwise an obligation of any bank or insured depository institution. Disclosures under Section 35, any person issuing or selling the securities of a registered investment company that is advised by or sold through a bank shall prominently disclose that the investment is in that the investment in the company is not insured by the FDIC or any other government agency. So that goes back to the on the premises of a bank rule again. You can never say that your abilities or qualifications have been passed upon by the United States. I'm approved by the SEC. No, 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 no. It is perfectly legal to say, I am registered, that the security is registered, if that is true. But you can't say approved, definitely not. 